Good morning. My name is Dan Elliott. I'm the Senior Policy Analyst with Oregon Housing and Community Services for the Energy Services uh, Unit. Uh, this morning I'm going to be meeting with Oregon IDA partners uh, to discuss the um, manufactured housing in, this or in the state uh, and its critical role uh, in affordable housing and uh, what they can do to help uh, assist in that platform we're dealing with today. Good morning, I'm Ken Pryor with Manufacturing Communities Resource Center. We're here today to work with the uh, folks from Oregon IDA regarding manufactured homes uh, and alerting them to the resources that are out there throughout the state for mediation and for just general education of rights and landlord tenant statutes. And we're looking forward to uh, furthering our influence and the uh, reach across the state. We're super appreciative for everyone who agreed to be on this panel. Um, we're really excited about the conversation. And notice I said first, we're hoping that the um, EPO panel become a series <coughs> as we take the opportunity uh, to share the depth of knowledge um, in this group, in our organizations, and in the larger asset building community. Um, the survey we sent out about today's meeting, there'll be space to make suggestions for other subjects that might make good topics for this collective space, so keep that in mind. Um, what, what are you guys interested in getting a little more in-depth on? There's been growing energy over the past few years to address the needs of folks who live in manufactured homes, a population whose incomes are largely in the lower income ranges. These are people IDA initiative providers are well positioned to serve where they're not already serving them. Oregon has been a leader in moving the conversation forward about manufactured homes in the affordable housing space, looking at ways to bring resources to bear to improve and replace the existing housing stock, much of which has outlasted its intended lifespan, resulting in unhealthy living conditions. Older stock is also generally, generally very energy inefficient um, and costly to residents in the environment. The idea for the panel emerged from how often manufactured home replacement was coming up in RFPs, work plan conversations, and the statewide housing plan. Um, it's an asset that's well positioned for the kind of resource stacking that we all like to see work better for our participants and is necessary in all areas of the asset building world. There are three bills moving in the legislature, I think we'll hear a little bit about that, that would add to the resources that are already available as well. Today we hope to do a few things. We want to provide an overview of the landscape of manufactured housing in Oregon. This housing stock is a critical part of the affordable housing stock. Much of it, if not most of it, in need of repair or replacement. Um, we'd also like to, as I said, share information among the FO body for organizations who are already working in this space, um, for FOs who do home ownership but haven't looked at the manufactured home um, space yet, and for FOs who work in other assets but whose clients um, undoubtedly intersect with this population. Um, IDAs and the support and education your programs provide could be a critical bridge for bringing a loan to an affordable level, for improving the risk profile to lenders who are trying to create better and safer loans, um, and helping savers make the best possible choices for themselves and their assets. Where can you all share resources, especially in thinking about resident and saver education? And finally, look at how HCS can support and resource um, FOs as a source of funds, but also research connections to residents and a contact point for statewide resources like energy funds. So with that, um, we'll be hearing from our panelists. So we have Dan Elliott, Senior Policy Analyst at HCS, <coughs> um, Ken Pryor, Manufacturing Community Resource Center Program Coordinator, uh, Brian shelton Kelly down here, um, over at DataWorks on Quad, Director of Acquisitions and Development. Lisa Rogers from CASA, um, who's been focusing on this over there. And then um, we have Karen Sachs from NETCO. And welcome, Lauren Murek, right, who's very new to NETCO, but will be um, working in our manufactured housing program. Um, so we're going to start with Dan. And then after we've heard from all of our panelists, we're going to have time to have some conversations. So, Think about the questions that you have about this um, and how your organizations can connect. Were you gonna? Um, yeah, sure. This is actually working, so you can move. See if it'll work across. Otherwise, you can come over to this seat. Look at that. It works. <laughs> I'll stay seated. And never gonna look up. How's that? Sound? So good morning, and I just wanted to thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity, giving us all the opportunity to come in here and share some information. Uh, about this very important piece of affordable housing in, in, 
the collective of uh, units that we're looking at. Um, in regards to manufactured homes, um, um, my background uh, stems 25 years in energy efficiency and work around low income weatherization, building assistance, uh, clean energy, green energy. I've seen a lot, in, in, in the, and I've been with the department for about 17 years now. And um, give you a little bit of the name behind kicking the can. I'm going to tell you this next one. Um, I call this the moment, and just to set up kind of a kind of where all of this uh, serendipity uh, thinking came in for me. This is me 27 years ago. So I was an energy auditor supervisor for one of our community action agencies, and uh, this is a manufactured home uh, near uh, Florence. Uh, of which I went out to, uh, uh, to uh, replace windows. Unfortunately, I realized I needed to replace the entire wall uh, in order to put the windows in. That, 25 years ago, was a manufactured home that was already 30 years old. So when I looked at that, we spent about $8,000 of that money 25 years ago to do that manufactured home. And one of the things that I saw uh, uh, recently, I. Uh, as years went by, I became the state director for the Weatherization Assistance Program, and this agency came to me uh, about several years ago, about seven years ago, uh, to ask if they could re-weatherize certain units, and we do allow that from time to time. This was one of the units that they submitted to me. I go, that, that seems very familiar and personal to me. And I went, that's still there. And I went, you've got to be kidding me. It's still there. And it's, it was still, it was a rental at the time, and they wanted to put, upgrade it and put another probably $10,000 into the unit at the same time. So over that span, $18,000 for a unit that probably was no more than $3,000. And it was a rental, nonetheless. Now, it's a good thing, this is good work, because it's keeping some affordable housing in place, and it's keeping some shelters at the same time. But when we were looking at this housing stock, it was never really intended to last more than 35 years, maybe, maybe, if you're doing it well. So I began to ask the question, is this the best use of our resources? Is there another way that we could use the resources? Yes, it's important to do the work on the homes and upgrade them, but can we do some more work to move folks into ownership with that type of How can we get them into healthier, more efficient, long-term uh, buildings? I'm sure you see that. So let's give, let's give you an overview of the state and the conditions of what we're looking at. So as far as the numbers, these are the numbers uh, specific to Oregon. 8% uh, live in about a, almost 140,000 of these uh, are in the state. To give you an idea, uh, 140,000 units are in the state. 80,000 of those are, we like to target them as pre-1980 HUD code, which means these buildings are not built to anything that we would recognize as standard building code. These are two by two studs. I think you can see in the, in the picture back here. Uh, I actually had to cut those two by fours down to two by twos so I could get them into the frame of that. Uh, we're talking staples, glue, uh, adhesives. This is what's holding these up. Uh, for, and it causes, it, uh, causes lots of other problems. So that's Oregon. Now, when we look at how do we move folks into home ownership, which is where the IDA comes in, and it can also do the help with the repair piece, too. This, these, are, these are numbers from the national numbers. So 77% of manufactured home residents own their homes, uh, but a good majority of those are renters as well. 61% uh, of other types have owned their homes. So when you look at that, that comparison and what we're looking at, it comes down to the way that they have to finance these buildings, right? Uh, and I'll let our panelists will cover into that as well. But you, you're looking at buildings uh, that uh, are not on land, uh, they're not land, so they have to look at uh, uh, financing in the form of what called chattel loans. You may have heard or may not have heard of those. These are very high interest rate loans. Uh, to purchase, uh, much like purchasing a car, it's in the same same venue. It's not a mortgage type of building unless the building itself is put on property that you own and it's on a foundation. Yes, ma'am. Can I ask a really stupid, simple question? What makes a manufactured home? Why do we call it manufactured home? Ah. So, like, it's, I know there's trailers and there's, you know, so what? Sure. 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 Ken, you want to you want to do that, or I can do it. I can do code, or you can do it. No, I, I, there's a, a federal manufacturing uh, specification that homes have to be built to. Um, in the early versions, you had things like aluminum wiring and things of that nature that were hazardous. So, in about, I was a 76, 74, whatever. They, they created a federal standard for manufacturing in terms of the, the material use in terms of plumbing, wiring, all of that. And it's probably, it's the only federal regulation for any kind of housing in the country. Everything else, you know, it's basically whatever the state county, but 
if you're building a manufactured home, uh, that home will have a tag on it saying it meets federal standards. And, uh, you know, so it's, that's if, why if they build it off site. They build it off site and move it to a site, it's going to be a manufactured home of some kind. That's the, probably the easiest way to look at it. And you'll see that they'll call, you'll hear trailers, you'll hear mobile homes, and you'll hear manufactured homes. In Oregon, in the code, they actually break it down to identify. Mm -hmm. So if you've got, help me know the dates, if it's, I think it's 58 yeah. and less, it's a trailer. <coughs> and then uh, 59 up to 90, 90, yeah. 90 is, a is a mobile home. And then 90 and on, they call manufactured homes, which is interesting. But when you see the buildings, you go, oh, oh yeah, okay, I get it. Uh, so, <laughs> different standards, different conditions. Yeah, I'd like to ask a follow-up question. Um, when was the last time the federal guidelines were updated? Because technology is a thing and building innovation is a thing. Uh, you probably have to have somebody in building codes. Um, but so no, there's a real 2000. lack of, of information and, and keeping abreast of the new technologies that are there, the tiny homes. Uh, they don't bear, most, for the most part, they don't bear that federal tag. They're Built and there's really not a lot of reason uh, they could be it built to federal standards and not you know, be more durable and not really sacrifice a lot of cost. The last movement was around 2000, is what I recall. Um, I, I believe that's that sounds about right. Sounds right. Yeah. Less, less substantial. And so, uh, so what are we? What year are we in? 2019. <laughs> so that'll give you an idea of how. And constantly in Oregon, we're always progressing with codes. They're always changing, 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 especially with the energy efficiency increases. So you can see this is a very affordable housing. Even the energy efficient ones that they have today, very good. I would purchase one of these for my property. They are fantastic. They're they're, they're no different. In fact, they're a, a lot in some ways than some of the stick built uh, structures as well. And they're incredibly affordable. Uh, so looking at that, this is where they play that part in first time homeowners. This is where they play that part with bridging, bringing people uh, into uh, wealth building. And there's one thing where we can do the repairs on these things, but there's the other piece where it's like, okay, we'll always have that, we'll always need to do that. But what about getting folks into some wealth building, just taking them a little step further, right? What do we need to do? What's, how do we jump that? For just, just to muddy the waters even further, you may have heard the term modular home. Mm -hmm. So a, a modular home is a, is a home that's built in a factory, but built to local building code. So it's distinct from a manufactured home. So modular homes and manufactured homes are both built in a factory, so built not on the site where they'll ultimately go in a controlled environment. Modular homes are built to building code. The manufactured home is built to this national height code. Uh, and then both are shipped to the site where they're installed. There's nothing mobile about either one of them. <laughs> <True. Right. laughs> yeah. In fact, one of the things you'll find out with older homes, uh, the ones that are pre-80, actually some that are moved at, uh, in the 90s too, you can't get them, you can't move them. They're, they're not mobile. So the homes you see in most of these properties, you're not mobile units. They're, they're there, and they're still there for that reason. Um, and there's a whole lot of other things that go along uh, with, uh, with those little ones. So here's a little breakdown. This is a little old data, but the information isn't that much different for the following years. But just to show you the difference in the costs here in Oregon, right? So when we're looking at first-time homeowners and we're looking at the uh, moving folks LMI, um, or moderate income, into this is a pretty popular uh, venue. One of the things we saw was a doubling in 2015 and 16 in our first-time home ownership uh, program uh, for first-time home buyers. Those that purchase manufactured homes, it doubled. It went from like 23% to 54%. It was amazing. We went, what's happening here? And that was just as the recession went away and folks were moving back in, this is what they were purchasing. There we go. More demographic information. And there's a, there's a plethora of data in here, and I encourage you guys to, to grab a hold of this and, and, and hold on with the, this information. It's good for identifying the population we're looking at. Um, median household income, this is national, these are pretty consistent with the race and ethnicity. SNAP benefits we added on there as well. What are the conditions, right? So this is why we looked at uh, those, uh, we broke it down into that pre-HUD. And so this is specific to Oregon, so you can have a very good idea of what we're dealing with it as far as this housing stock is involved, right? So there's 100, remember it said 140,000, 140,000 of these units. 80,000 of those 140,000 are pre-1980 structures, okay? We're moving another 10 years and they will move into the first level of 
uh, ship up state housing. Uh, they will. Uh, they'll, they'll, they'll become historical building first tier. Okay. <laughs> When you think about that, so we're, so we're looking at that. Okay, that's becoming interesting. Yeah. You got, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so that's a whole other level of. Oh my gosh, how do we deal with that? But you can see the conditions of the homes, and just keep in mind the building. There's always a. Where are they? This is a great piece of data. So if your service territory is on here, which it is, take a look at your counties. I know it's really small, um, but when you grab it, you can take a very good um, view with the counties. And what the makeup is. We'll send is, these slides out, guys, so that you can read them more yes, carefully. Yes, yes. Yeah. Thank you. It takes all the yeah. It's like, oh my God. Try to write this down. It's okay. I'll get it to you as well. So it's the, uh, this, uh, this does break it down. This is data that we use um, uh, to uh, on our mapping too, which you'll see on short towards the end here. But um, this breaks it down. This lets you know how the manufactured homes make up. Uh, how, what's the percentage of manufactured homes that, that make up the building stock in that county, along with single families and multifamily. And so some of these counties, you can see, yikes, uh, there's quite a bit, right? This is a, this is a housing of choice uh, uh, with, with these properties. And we broke it down by parks, too, over 1,200 parks, communities. So we also took that information and we did some mapping. And I'll share you with this. It's an interactive map it's, uh, uh, that I'll provide for you. It's on our website. And you can go in and you can actually find. We've, we have the benefit of knowing exactly where every manufactured home is in the state, uh, the owner. Uh, the condition of the house, the, well not necessarily the condition, we know the year, uh, how many bedrooms, uh, um, <laughs> uh, what it heats with, uh, among other things. And so we have this great data that most states do not have. We've consolidated this. So we know, and you'll see there's a tool that we provided that we know where, we know where this is. We've got a very good insight onto what we're dealing with for this housing stock type. So when that 80,000, remember I said that was pre-1980, 60,000 of them are low income. So when you take 60,000 of these, these, these units, uh, when I was talking to utilities on the energy efficiency side, they took 60,000 units that were pre-1980, they weren't going to improve in energy because they only had an inch and a half thick wall, there was nothing you could do, windows, heating systems, they weren't going to be a sieve to the grid. And so when they put 60,000 units in their brain, that's the size of Eugene and Springfield if you replaced every residential unit, multifamily, and single family with a manufactured home. Now, if you had that alone land and space, you'd have a problem for your grid on energy use. You'd want to do something about it, right? So when you look at it from an enterprise piece, they're motivated, and they went, oh gosh, it's better to invest in these homes. This is where they begin to set aside money, Bonneville Power, the utilities. Um, they get it now. And so they're looking at this housing stock and going, we need to do something here about this housing stock in a big way. Much in the same way we improve Cars, we've got to do something about these as well for more reasons than just energy. So that mapping on that map that you'll see here is an interactive map that goes down to the census tract level that you'll have access to uh, at the end of the day here. Um, and this map, uh, you see the darker blue is done there. What we do is we, care, we, we balance that with how many people were low income and how many people uh, landed into uh, a pre-1980 home. So the darker the blue, that's where our hotspots were. Low income with buildings that were pre-1980. Here's your annual median income, gives you an idea for the households. We call it the largest source of naturally occurring affordable housing, for those of you that know the NOAAs. Average cost of single wide, 42,000. This is a hidden secret, low income weatherization assistance <coughs> program. Has anybody ever heard of that? Yes, okay, it is the largest manufactured home repair program that nobody ever heard about. Predominantly, most of the work that we did, I pulled the data from our weatherization assistance programs over the last few years, and I said, well, what's the makeup of our completions? I mean, how many, what's the, how many single families are we doing? How many manufactured homes are we doing? Wow, MH, manufactured homes, single building, uh, site built, those are state built uh, on the properties, and then uh, uh, multifamily on the left. You see that percentage for manufactured homes? Right, it's increasing. So 2018, it's 52%, okay? So when you're looking at that, that's a pretty significant uh, work. So we went, oh my gosh, the majority of our work and effort, this is who's coming into our doors. We're not seeking them out. This is who's coming in and asking for the need and that needs the help. So when we're looking at, that's the housing stock that we need to address and look at. And here's the other thing. So I said, well, let's break it down by county and break it down by agency. You might recognize the agency names over there. You've probably partnered with many of them. Um, and I encourage you to partner with them in this case as well because they have grant money to do this type of work. They can also work with a customer as well with the IDA. 
There's your counties. You can see Jackson County and Kirk Deschutes and Jefferson at 71%, 80%. Uh, yeah, quite a bit in those territories, right? Um, I'm just gonna let those numbers sit there. It'll give you an idea, okay? Does everybody eyeball their counties? Yeah, okay. So, challenges. Long-term control over the land beneath the manufactured homes. Home and installation quality. Mortgage and other key fi uh, quality financial products. Marion's talked about the chattel loans. They can't get a mortgage. What are we doing about it? There are programs. We're doing the best we can. We've, we've really, we're doing better too. There's some things coming up uh, in this session, and uh, we're making some crossovers uh, in regards to how we might be able to better stack our programs and the fund and the financing, and, and how we do this. And so these are all programs that currently impact manufactured homes uh, and those buying and those that live in them. The governor's interest is significant. Executive Order 1720. This was in uh, December of 2017. She directed our department, as you can see, including a manufactured home replacement program through pilot programs and initiatives. She gets it. She gets it. So do the legislatures. Uh, legislature. Um, so far, there's legislators. Um, <laughs> the rest. But so we are moving into some pilots. Uh, Energy Trust of Oregon is doing some pilots uh, as well. They get it as well. They're, mo motiv they're motivated to move towards uh, that as well. Um, you'll hear, you'll probably hear from the panelists a little bit about this. this is, these are some of the goals, things that we'll be doing with this manufactured home replacement. This is difficult work to do. It's a difficult population to work with, and you'll hear more about that as well. But uh, not to work with, but to get there, right? To bridge that, and that's what we're doing. We're trying to, we're ice breaking. This is a sample of the loans that we're looking at right now. Sample uh, breakout. Uh, that 312 for that monthly loan payment, that actually has got to be lower. We've got to get that under 200 when you're looking at fixed incomes, which is where we need more stacking. We need some, some sort of cooperation that we're looking at. These are the outcomes we'll be looking at. Workforce developments included health benefits, cost savings. This is stuff that uh, our partners here are working with. Uh, Energy Trust on, as well as us, and, and uh, Craft 3 is a lender. Let's talk about the legislature. There's one bill up here that's missing. 2893. 2893 is also a bill, but it's not bringing in money, but what it does do is it, it uh, directs the Oregon Housing and Community Services Department to uh, put together a work group committee okay. to constantly address uh, the issues of manufactured housing and what we can do to address it. Um, and so that's 93, 94, 95, 96. Hospital 96, 3 million for a loan to nonprofit community, uh, CDFIs, established acquisition fund for manufacturing home parks. Another half a million administered uh, by our department, provides grants to homeowners to pay up to 80%. And then there's a 2 million supplemental home loan program to provide support and home loans for uh, folks uh, purchasing new energy efficient manufacturing homes. So there are, there's interest and there's movement, and these have legs. They're already into ways and means. And there's a uh, Oregon manufacturing. Remember that assessment? We don't, you can, if you want, you can click on it. If we've got time. If not, um, uh, I encourage folks to go to uh, this link when you get it. Uh, I'll give you a visual of what that looks like. I don't know if we're on Wi Fi there. I think we, we might open, I think you might open it up on the side. No. Take it and drag it to the left and right. Ah, there you go. That's it. Hit OK. That's the first page, and then uh, the far bottom right. It's huge. Okay. So this website is the one that you can go in and interact with. You go right down to the house rooftop level to see where these units are. It provides demographics, uh, uh, status, um, and conditions of the buildings. Go right. It should be an okay. Go to the, actually, you're on the. Go. Yeah, go back. You're on a sub page. It should be an okay to click it to activate the actual page. There you go. You get the hands. You should go to a couple. Oh, it, I don't yeah, know why it, it 
it's making it it's jumping me to the That's okay. There you go. Whatever. There we go. Okay. <coughs> there, I'll show real quick so you can do it. Um, so on this So over here, you can get, actually, you're pretty close here on this one. You can click on here. You've got the manufactured parks. You can see as it clicks off. Parks there. There's census tract information. So you can get right down to, let's see. Click on this community here. Here's your census tract area for that area. It tells you to make up housing stock. Median income, pre-1980. What do you think? There's lots of other, other layers on this map as well. So I encourage you to go on here and take a look. Use it to your advantage. There you go. Good? OK. Well, that's all I have for today. Is everybody warmed up? <laughs> Who we are? Yeah. Um, we, we're, you can find us on the uh, on the web by just googling MTRC slash Oregon, comma Oregon, and it will take you to our website. That will we'll get you to the the mapping. But more than anything else, it will give you a lot of information on uh, you know, a park directory, so you can find out who the players are and where the parks are, if there are any vacancies. Uh, we're sort of a cross between a, uh, an information repository where we answer questions of both landlords and tenants regarding manufacturing home parts. Uh, we're not attorneys, but we do help them understand statute. Uh, we do a lot of referral work to places like DEQ and or legal aid, depending upon uh, what you find. Um, the other part of us, we're uh, Sort of evangelists for mediation. We try to keep people in their homes and selling things out of court. And we work with, uh, uh, we have 16 or so partners in various parts of the state. So we'll have, uh, and some of them are nonprofits, some are tied to uh, the, the local county government. Uh, but anyway, there we more or less farm that mediation capability because there's really only one of me and uh, half of another person right now we're working on a few more people. But uh, what it has shown me, um, and one of the ways I have related to it, is uh, from time to time we'll have someone come in and they'll show us their contract, their, their bill of sale for a home, and maybe they've got a dispute or they don't understand anything, and they'll, they'll ask us to, uh, to help um, you know, interpret things. Um, and we find that many of the, these families are having down payments of fifteen and twenty thousand dollars. And so there is a market there, but they don't quite understand or the, the financial institutions um, kind of you know that this is a, sort of a last resort for family. it's not the most prominent uh, uh, you know, part of their business as, and it's overlooked oftentimes. But, you know, I, I can relate to that, uh, those individuals that are, you know, really, I, I, it's very impressive to me that they can garner fifteen or twenty thousand dollars to put down on a home. And how I relate to it is that uh, growing up in uh, Detroit, Michigan, um, my parents is somewhat of a similar immigrant experience. Uh, they moved from Pennsylvania to Detroit because that's where the jobs were. Um, I have an older brother and sister that are six years older than me, um, seven, six and seven years older than me. Point of it is, is that my dad worked five, five years, he worked two jobs in a factory so that we could be in a home. And all of us 
there were five of us. All of us have always bought homes, always been homeowners. Uh, and the other thing is, they uh, we banked with the bank that made that initial loan, all five of us, until that bank was absorbed through whatever. But we all got loans and had checking accounts at Manufacturers National Bank. And all the people around us, we lived, um, our first home was in a little suburb of Detroit called Hamtramck that was 85% Polish. And all those people had ties to banks. Same story. Um, so there was a market there and that same dedication and that same uh, desire to be homeowners, I see that same desire in many of the people that I see in these parts that I recognize from my dad. So uh, I think it's, uh, I'm really glad that these programs are now appearing. Uh, what we do or what we can do because we do go to parks, we help them organize homeowner groups so that they can begin to you know, educate themselves to understand what statute is and you know, understand what their rights are and also understand, you know, we promote the weatherization program like crazy because we get complaints from landlords saying their homes are in disrepair or whatever. Uh, and there are, we haven't uh, basically cataloged all these. Uh, there, there are so many more programs now, we're going to have to identify those and put them on a card or a handout um, to give visibility to uh, the IDA program and weatherization the CASA, uh, because we're constantly out there, we're constantly making contact either by the phone or through our mediators. So uh, we do exist, uh, been around since actually 1989, uh, but we're probably one of the uh, best kept secrets in state government. Uh, the mediation, just for your own information, uh, that's no charge. To either landlord or tenant, uh, and uh, we've looked at some of the, the uh, uh, shortcomings of uh, home ownership in manufactured parts because there are different sets of laws. Uh, and after um, right now, there's a bill in the uh, legislature now to support uh, an attorney that will be dedicated to manufactured home parts. So we're making pro you know, progress there, but uh, uh, I, I think it's becoming more and more a, a good investment and there are people there that uh, want to grow and want, uh, want skin in the game. So if you have any questions, we have a website. And we'll definitely have a chance for questions to follow up. Sure. Um, so, good morning. Again, my name is Brian Sheldon Kelly. I'm with NeighborWorks Um uh, So, NeighborWorks Aqua is a community development corporation in uh, Southwest Oregon. Uh, most of our work's focused on Douglas, Coos, Curry, Jackson, Josephine, and, and some parts of Southern Lane County. Um, so, we're primarily a rural-focused uh, organization. We work in affordable housing uh, development, um, home ownership. Uh, creation and promotion, um, economic development, and um, the IDA program. Um, I'm sure you know Carlos and Sammy. Um, so we, we've been engaged with uh, manufacturer housing issues on a couple of different fronts um, for, I, I think we're coming up at about a decade. I think we realized um, that you know in our communities, manufactured housing was an important part of the housing stock. Um, Needed, needed a different um, kind of uh, approach to it um, uh, because as, you know, as the data points out, it, it is the largest source of unsubsidized affordable housing in many of our communities. Um, and uh, so, so we've, we've worked on a, on a couple different fronts. So home replacement, uh, both on land owned by um, homeowners, but also starting now uh, in, in parks. Uh, park preservation and um, uh, home repair and home rehabilitation. Um, and each of those, each of those is is a is a different approach. They all have their own unique challenges and, and, and quirks. 
Um, but I think we, we really see them as all, all important because they all uh, help support the overall goal of, of providing better quality of life and uh, housing conditions for, uh, for folks. Right. Can, can you reiterate that for the people who aren't as familiar, just the difference between the types of land that sure. these homes are on? Sure. Because it's a significant yeah. issue and sure. why this is a challenging space. Yep. So, so sure. So generally, you know, generally we see two main types. Um, uh, you know, land that's owned by the owner. So what we call you know fee simple land. So this is this is land that's owned or or can be purchased. Um, or uh, or um, leased land uh, or leased lots, generally in the context of a manufactured home park. So where some, an owner um, owns the land and leases uh, a spot or a parcel or a lot uh, to to the homeowner or to the occupant um, in exchange for a month, monthly rent, essentially, um, to to be able to occupy that space. Um, and that's 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 really different. Um, you own the land, own the fee simple title to it. You know that's a that's a real asset. Land is really an asset that, that can be either leveraged or or uh, or contribute to the, the overall um, you know financial uh, uh, condition of the of the household or the family. Um, in a lease land situation, you know again the, the the person that may own the unit doesn't necessarily own the land under it. Um, they lease it from another owner. Um, and I think Lisa will probably talk about the resident owned co-op uh, model, um, uh, which is which is a way to kind of address that um, underlying land ownership and some of the uh, inequities that come with. Uh, you know, um, I think what we're one of the things we're seeing, and one of the reasons we're we're addressing this as a field is we're seeing kind of a transition from um, parks uh, that may have been owned by families for several decades, a few generations, um, where that family may have had close ties to the residents, um, uh, which causes its own you know, kind of unique things sometimes. Uh, but I, I think we're seeing a uh, transition to parks that are owned by um, economically motivated um, either owners or, or investors who may not have the same ties with the community and may have different objectives in, in their ownership of the land. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're as a nonprofit, we're kind of exploring that <coughs> nonprofit-owned model, and then there's, there's the resident-owned co-op model, which is uh, which is a. Uh, 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 I'll let Lisa talk about that. Um, um, and and again, so when you don't own the land, your financing options are are very different. So you're generally working with um, you know personal property type loans, which are generally higher interest, shorter term. Um, and 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 when we look broader, you know, a lot of the a lot of the a lot of the uh, financing uh, that's available for manufactured homes that are on lease land or or on in parks, those financial service companies are very intimately tied to the and related to some of the dealers and the actual you know many the the the, the companies that actually produce. The home. So, on the back end, a lot of the manufactured home industry is very vertically in integrated. It may not seem seem that up front, but on the back end, there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, crossover, and it's uh, it's a uh, it's a successful economic model for um, uh, a lot of investors, um, um, but doesn't necessarily benefit the lower or moderate income people that we're typically working with, um, and. Uh, uh, yeah, so that's that's one thing we're trying to address with, with our work and with our with our partners. Um, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about like property taxes when it comes to like leasing and renting? Like, I've heard from quite a few people that they like rent or lease the land, and then on top of that, they have to pay the yearly tax or whatnot. How so does that yeah, so um, um, the the. So if you're in a, if you're leasing land in a in a park, um, generally I'd say your 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 ground lease or your lease fee would cover the property taxes, but because the unit is personal property, there's personal property taxes. So 
So that, that is a cost that, 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 that households or owners have is, is, pro is personal property tax, or excuse me, personal property taxes, um, um, which, uh, you know, I think different jurisdictions have different rates, but, you know, that, that's, that's, not, that's not insignificant. And um, I think one thing we've seen is especially, so a newer unit is worth more and it's probably going to be valued more than an older unit. So the, the, the differential in what someone may have been paying in personal property taxes with an old unit to what they're paying now could, could be, could, there could be some payment shock there. Um, um, you know, even if the total amount isn't terribly much, but the, the, that is a difference, yeah. yeah. That's something, something to consider. What about the, the utilities, you know, with leasing and, is it that it's regulatory, like there's the regu regulations that you have to provide the sewer or water? So I don't, I, I, I don't, good question. I don't know if there's any, I don't know about the regulations. There are statutes that say yeah. they have to furnish yeah. uh, power, water, sewer. Um, many times uh, uh, electric utilities are supplied and paid for by the tenants yeah. directly, but uh, typically the water connection and sewer are county or city or state. So. And sorry, and they, what they'll do, right? So a lot of them, typically, the water line comes into the park, and you have one meter, mm -hmm. and then goes and services all the houses. Yeah. A lot of the investor owners are now submetering. Yeah. Uh -huh. And so what they'll do is, they they'll just go ahead and let the people have to sign up with the utility company mm -hmm. to pay their own water and sewer, as well as they have pedestals for the electricity too. So investor and investors are not reducing the lease space right. when they're putting right. the so payment something. requirement right. onto right. the, uh, no. the residents. Part of that whole process of going to sub-metering, you have to account for the contribution people were paying when the utility or the water was in the rent, and the statute requires them to back out that amount, and that becomes the new basis for uh, their water bill or the rent rather, and then the water bill is you know, whatever the meter shows. Yes, and however what they are arguing is the cost of sub-metering yeah. they're passing on to the, the yeah. tenants, so thus the rent yeah. doesn't decrease, right. even though it should. Yeah, no, that's, well, numbers don't fly. Numbers don't fly, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think, you know, some of our, some of our broad kind of lessons learned in, in this work, um, uh, yeah, and in terms of home replacement, um, uh, since every family's situation is a bit different, um, our home replacement uh, uh, kind of interventions have really had been tailored to meet those families' um, needs and situations. So, so not only might their might their uh, physical conditions be different. So, you know, lots might be different sized or have you know, failing septic systems that need to be replaced or um, odd survey or title issues that have to be worked through. Um, um, you know, the family's financial capacity and, 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 and background and characteristics are different. So in a way we've had to kind of, each project was an artisan or a, or a niche kind of project. So I, we haven't quite been able to figure out how to say, okay, here's the, here's the product or the program or the service that, you know, one size fits all. <coughs> Right, and you can just tap into this and, and replace your home. Um, I, I think another thing in home replacement uh, that we've really learned is there's there's a lot of coordination that has to happen. Um, so again, we're getting a, a unit that's made in a factory delivered to the site. There's a lot of other coordination that has to happen in terms of site prep, um, you know, foundations, um, install, um, uh, utility connections, uh, various permits that might be needed you know, so in the city of Roseburg, we have to get a plan review permit, and we have to go to our county to get a placement permit, and there's an electrical permit. So there's all these different moving parts um, that adds complication, and um, you know, may may. I, I think one thing we've realized is you know it's complicated for us who are kind of practitioners in this field. Without a navigator kind of function for families, this is very difficult to figure out on their own. Um, uh, 
um, especially the you know the the, end of the sequencing of the work, um, but also kind of all the steps that have to go uh, be gone through. Um, May I ask a question, Brian? Yeah. Can that part of the process be kind of, you know, put somewhere on a piece of paper or a model or something that, you know, just the permitting, because like you said, you know, I mean, it's hard to navigate yeah. that. Yeah. So, so for, even though each community is going to have different permits, mm -hmm. there are some that are the same across the board that we could even create that kind of a model that, yeah, so I think that's one thing that we're looking at in the Manufactured uh, Housing Steering Committee. It's kind of really documenting, you know, documenting, documenting our learnings and documenting some of this work, so we can come kind of have those kind of tools that we can we can rely on. Um, then, I, then I think also just navigating the various resources and, and, and incentives or subsidies that might be out there. Um, again, it's complicated for us. It's it's probably even more so for the for the families we're working with, right? So. You know, Craft 3 has a new loan pro product. There's the <coughs> Trust of Oregon incentive and the investor owned utility footprint. Um, you know, there's various weatherization resources, but you know, having someone that can kind of put all those together in a package that makes sense is, is, is a I mean, missing link at this point. Yeah. That's the pilot part. Yes. Those, those pilots, that's the yes. Nobody else is doing this. Yeah. May I ask another question? So have you had any um, experience with USDA or USDA uh, direct? Um, so we are, uh, so our loan packager has been working with a family in um, uh, Umpqua Ranch, which is a residential community up, okay. up in up, uh, up, uh, near Roseburg, mm -hmm. um, on, a, on using the 502 direct loan uh, in a pilot capacity to replace their unit. Um, it has not been fast. There one so the so USDA a few years ago kind of allowed Oregon to be in this pilot. There were some legislative changes that were needed, so we got those last year. We've been slowly moving through. Lisa might have more updates. I, I know there's some there's been some technical challenges and some uh, infrastructure um, challenges with with the 502 program in this particular case. Um, so it's a it's a potential tool, but I think. We need to do a lot more beta testing of it to actually get it implementable. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. But it, it's it's there, and it's just, it's one of those things that we need to yeah. track. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. yeah. Is this a good spot to have Lisa give us a little update on Casa's working on? Hi, everybody. I'm Lisa with Casa, um, and we in 2008 became a um, a certified technical assistant provider under the ROC USA model. And ROC USA is a national organization that is based on the New Hampshire Community <coughs> Loan Fund model where they are uh, would take manufactured home parks, form a cooperative out of the residents, and help them purchase the park so that it becomes a resident-owned community. That's ROC, it's resident-owned community. <coughs> and so since that time, um, we've been working with different, um, different parks throughout the state to go ahead and, and, and make them into resident communities. So to date, we have 14 resident communities and they're all over the place. They're in Gold Beach, they're up in Warrington, they're out in Boardman, they're, they're everywhere. And how it comes to us is that through Ken's department, um, they passed a law, an opportunity purchase law a few years ago um, where any owner of a park, if they're going to sell their park, they used to be able to just do these 1031 exchanges. You wouldn't even know that the park ownership changed hands uh, if you were a resident in the park, except that maybe there was a change in property management and where you would send your check to. So opportunity to purchase language says that the owner has to notify the residents that they're going to sell the park, and the residents have <coughs> a certain window of time to go ahead and put in an offer on that park. And the owner can't offer it to anybody else except the residents during this specific period of time. So uh, when we get that notification, because it goes to Ken, Ken <coughs> then forwards it on to us. Frequently, the residents have already had the, the notice, and in their notice it says contact us if you have an interest in purchasing the park. So we then will try to get information from the owner about the um, operations of the park, what their costs are, how old the park is, all of these different things. 
Um, we run performers, uh, and then we'll put an offer in on the park. Um, what we're coming up against in terms of some difficulty right now is that the owners only have to give the residents an opportunity to put in an offer. They don't have to accept the offer. And even if you make a full price <laughs> offer, which is usually above what it would appraise for, the owner will still decline to sell it to the residents because it takes us like 150 days to get to closing rather than the you know, 60 to 90 days that, that an investor owner would, would come up with. And that 150 days is because we need to organize the residents into a cooperative so that by the time the park is purchased, they are ready to go ahead and own and operate that park. Um, so it's a really quick time frame for them. And then in the transactional side of things, the owners are thinking that it's a really slow period. So we're trying to work on, on how to go ahead and get that resolved. Um, <clears throat> as a result of, of, of converting these parks to resident ownerships, a lot of the parks that come our way, or even if owners come to us, are parks that are usually quite a bit older, built in the 60s or 70s. The homes came in at around the same time, and the homes are in really poor condition. Uh, they're not energy efficient, um, but a lot of the folks that live in these parks are the very lowest income folks. Um, and so they really don't have an option to move a mobile home, costs you probably about $15,000. And most of them, because of their age, would not <coughs> survive the move. And no other park would take that home into it. So they're not really mobile, is the reality, right? But under the resident ownership model, the value of the homes increase because their rents become stabilized and they have this, it's, it's kind of an empowerment program that allows them then to make decisions on how that park is going to be run. So it's, it, it works really well. But then we have the homes and so we're like, what are we going to do with these homes? We can use um, the weatherization money to go ahead and fix them up. But I think what we were finding is, is that, and we asked and they said yes, that instead of using that fifteen to 20000 to do repairs to an existing home, we can now use it to put it as a down payment towards the purchase of a new home. Um, and so a group of us have gotten together, like they were saying, Energy Trust, some of the nonprofits, uh, St. Vincent de Paul, Naval Example La Casa, um, NOAA, um, Craftery, RD, have all come together to try to figure out a way to be able to replace these homes um, in a way that's going to be affordable to very, very, very low-income folks. And so folks are talking about um, chattel loans. So chattel loans are usually, they're going to be 10% or higher in their interest rate. Um, they're going to have a shorter term, like 10 years, to pay it off. And so the cost is really, folks are not going to be able to afford to actually purchase one of those homes. If you can use the RD loan, it's a, it's a, if they're really low income, it's a 1% loan over 30 years. The difference between 1% and 10% and 30 years and 10 years is huge in terms of what that payment repayment process will be. So we, um, and, and like Brian was saying, there's not just the financing piece that you've got to consider. It's, it's having a dealer's license because if you don't have a dealer's license and you go straight to the manufacturer, you're going to pay up an extra $20,000 on top of the cost of the home <coughs> for that dealer's license to use to actually move the home. So, um, and then you have to have somebody, once the home is sighted, to come in and put in the skirting, and the stairs, and the porches, and hooking up to the utility. So there are all of these various pieces and components to it. So we actually applied to Meyer and got a grant from them to hire somebody to go ahead and to work with all of these groups to, to form a to actually memorialize the process that it would take to go ahead and replace a home in a in, um, in a in a man, manufactured home park, not so much on fee simple land. Because fee simple land, because you have the land, yeah. you can get mortgage financing rather than chattel financing. Yeah. When you're in a park, you can only get chattel financing. Um, so, and we worked with RD at Elko Ranch. Um, as the pilot program. The reason why it took as long as it did is because one of the things that came up after they converted to resident ownership is that they had a water source. Their well was drying up. And so they, RD says, we can't do this project until you solve your water source issue. 
because they're pulling water right off the Umpqua River. Ah, uh, well, uh, sure. Right? And so, right, and so they have to, they, they've been on a boil water nights for a while. But we're, we're about, that is, I, it, if it hasn't been resolved yet, it will be within the next month. Um, and then RD will start the process of being able to loan up these funds. But like I said, it, it, because of all of the different pieces of it, we're going to be hiring somebody because we've got this grant to actually put it all together and have a how-to manual. So at the end of the day, which we will share with anybody and everybody, how to replace homies in, in, a, in a park. One of the things that's going to be pretty difficult is in an investor-owned park, I'm going to guess most lenders are not going to actually lend to somebody in an investor-owned park because frequently that will end up with the investor and not with the, the resident. Um, but they're right, doing um, memorandums of understanding with the parks. So because the park is its own entity, it is the owner. So each home, each person in a resident community owns their own home, and then collectively they own the land. So it's kind of like a land trust model, mm -hmm. um, but not. It, it, but it's a little bit different because they are the owners. It's not like a nonprofit set aside that is going to that is going to be putting the money in and then getting a piece of that under like a land trust. Um, so we are, we, have, we do have this one person at um, Uncle Ranch who is just chomping a bit to, to actually replace her home. She is so excited. And hopefully, so we're working in partnership with Neighborhood Zone Club. They're gonna package the 502 loan because we don't know how to do that. Um, we're working with UCAN because they're gonna provide the uh, down payment assistance um, working with Energy Trust of Oregon, who is also, because they have an interest in getting these homes that are not energy efficient off the grid, because it's just, it's just pulling too much energy. Um, so they have some down payment money, and then we're going to use our IDA program to further help reduce the cost. So let's say the house is an $80,000 home, you get $40,000 worth of down payment assistance, you got a $40,000 loan, 1% 30 years, you're paying about $100 a month. Um, to have a brand new home. And so it, it, it will make sense for a lot of people. I think a lot of the folks that are in these parks will have a lot of credit repair and other things that they're going to need to do. And that's where Neighborhood Zonqua comes in because they'll be able to um, to advise them on what, what the process is that they need to go through. So in a nutshell, that's kind of what we have been doing. Um, we have, like I said, parks all over the place. And we have, um, when they form the resident community, uh, one of the things that is um, part of the whole program is that we provide ongoing technical assistance for the life of whatever loan they got to actually purchase that part. And so that's usually 20 to 30 years. So we will do technical assistance because it's how to form their board. Um, and then every year, the members vote on the board and the budget. And so these boards turn over. So they've got a board for three years, they're running smoothly, they vote an entirely new board, and so we are there to help them. Is that how, is that how the mediation's resolved in, in the board, or do you still go through the avenue of um, the program? Uh, so the resident communities are um, formed under a separate law. They're not subject to um, not landlord lease, the, the section 90, they're under section 62 of um, statute. So they are, um, they're not probably going to go through a similar mediation process. They can come and they do come and get linked to get all the time. Well, and we do support <laughs> mediations and yeah. at home parks because we get an annual stipend, I think it's $10 per home right. on an annual basis. And that's how the mediation part of the funding of the mediation program. So although they are a co-op, they can still qualify for mediation because they're paying at $10. Right, and yet they're still a member, so every member in the park has a vote to, to, you know, on who they want on the board, and that board is representative, and then is, your, is who is running the co-op at that point. And if they don't like that person the next year, they can vote them all and get somebody else. That's right. I'm curious, um, in these communities, uh, like if somebody owns the home, they don't own the land, or they're part of a community ownership, what if they aren't a good community member? What if they just don't pay the rent on the land, or they don't follow the rules of the norms of the community, but that structure is there? So they're yeah. just like in an investor-owned community, there's a, there's a property management company that the, the co-op hires because they don't really want to be responsible 
for evicting another member um, for non-payment. They don't want to have to go through any of that that's legal, so they hire a property management company that will do that. But when they form as a cooperative, they have articles and bylaws and community rules and leases. And so under all of those, everybody has to sign that they agree to those, those terms. It actually is beneficial because some of these parks the investor owner is not really on top of it, so you have really sometimes some bad elements. People you know, selling drugs, um, causing just all kinds of problems, and the rest of the community understands, and they don't really want that person there either, so they create a set of rules that are legal. They have a lawyer that they also contract with to look over all of these things. And then um, if the person cannot meet the standards that they've established as a group, then that person would have to sell their home, leave, abandon the home, whatever it is. Force them to sell their home. You can just tell them that they either have, they give them a period to cure, yeah. right? Yeah. And if they won't, and frequently they won't, um, usually in those instances, the home is not really worth much. And so they just walk away. And, then, and then the co-op ends up having to demolish the home because it's in a really, really, really bad condition. Like we're talking holes in the floors, all kinds of stuff. So then they have to spend nine to ten thousand dollars to demolish a home, and sometimes more if there's asbestos in any of the structures. Which, when they're old, they yeah. have asbestos. Yeah. So the co-op is taking on. It, it's not like it's an asset that they're going to want to keep. If there, it's a really nice home and somebody abandons it, they'll fix it up and they'll sell it to somebody else who wants to become a member of the co-op. But legally, can they force them if their structure is on the land? They can, they, they, they can tell them they need to, to leave, they can take their home with them. They can't afford to take their home with them, so they leave it. They, and the home isn't going to make it. You can, you can be evicted yeah, and, and, and not allowed to come back. And then, I, it's a, it's it's a quandary, same. right? It's, yeah. it's, it's because it, the unit is still technically their property until, until the, the formal abandonment process or sale process has, has happened. Yeah. Right. I think our experience has been most people walk away and then we go through the abandonment process and then we have a ten thousand dollar demolition bill. Right. But they would have to pay somewhere between ten and fifteen yeah, thousand to move the home. Which is which yes, it's people who live in manufactured home parks, particularly that are investor owned, like are I mean they're captive. They are super captive and thus the resident ownership piece of it gives them a voice on how they want their community to look. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. I'm gonna um just have us move to Karen um, so that we have time to hear from everybody and then we can do some more questions after that. Great. Um, so super confusing, right? <laughs> like lots of information. Um, which is why Netco hired Lorraine, which is very exciting. Um, so Lorraine's been here just shy of three weeks. Um, Lisa mentioned um, some funny things from Meyer. Um, Netco also received some money from Meyer. Um, Meyer Royal Trust has been um, a really great champion um, in kind of helping nonprofits and helping all of us really start to um, come into this space and figure out what we can do as a collective to really help um, current residents and current park um, folks who are in parks, but also on the new kind of first time home buyer side as well. So um, I'll kind of, I will say that we are the newest in this space. So we have come into this space based on lots of conversations that we've had over the last couple of years that we've been pulled into, um, mostly in our role as a, um, as a homeownership agency, both in the affordable homeownership development, but also on the education and counseling. So um, what we know is that there are, um, as you're hearing from Lisa and from Brian and from everyone else in the room, is that um, these can be one-off situations. They need to be, del they are delicate conversations that happen. You have folks who are very low income, who have been marginalized for a very long period of time, who are in homes that are falling apart around them. And so when you talk about repair, rehab, replacement, these are words that we throw out and they are terrifying to folks who actually live in the home, right? Who, who don't know where they might go. If a park is closing, just because you live in a manufactured housing and a low-income park doesn't mean you want to go into a multi-family, you know, three, four, five-story um, apartment complex, right? So how are we navigating that space for folks who actually live in here? Um, and so that's a lot of what we'll be kind of um, exploring, figuring out what's working, what's not, talking with residents, getting out there, really connecting with folks. 
um, and helping them kind of navigate that space. So when Brian talks about that need for a navigator, um, that's really what a, a lot of learning's role will be, is really getting out there and connecting with human beings and seeing what we can do to support them. Um, you heard a lot about this, um, kind of the, what I think is a really interesting cross kind of um, sector collaboration on manufactured housing. So you have um, energy folks, you have housing folks. Um, the other folks you, we maybe didn't mention yet are the healthcare folks, right? Because these are public health hazards in a lot of situations and people are um, mentally and physically ill because of the spaces that they're living in. And so we also have healthcare folks at the table saying, how can we also start to wrap around services and all start to layer um, opportunities for resources in order to help someone um, get a new unit. Um, CDFIs, which many of us are um, in this room, um, community development financial institutions, are also playing a really unique role in this fi uh, financing space. So um, as again, as you heard, the, a mortgage isn't really an option for many people if they're on rented land. And so how are we coming in to try to help, um, I shall step back, the word mortgage is also has a lot of baggage for folks, right? So, and most people don't want a mortgage. So we talk about, oh, well, we can replace your unit and you'll have a new mortgage, and they're, nope, not me. I don't want a mortgage. I very specifically don't have a mortgage. Um, so how are we looking at unique financing opportunities? CDFIs can play a lot of that role. So Craft3, um, NetFoz is CDFI, Health Community Lending Works, uh, and I said um, other folks in the room do as well. So how are we coming together really um, consciously as a group of nonprofits and in conjunction with the state and um, to really kind of push this work forward and really support the residents that are out there? Um, on the flip side of that, so the other half of this world is going to be um, the first time home buyer opportunities that are um, that exist. So uh, we have, I mean, as all of you know, who do home ownership education counseling and work with first time buyers, the market right now is not providing entry for low and moderate first time buyers. And so when we see stick homes being built that are in our, uh, you know, down in the Eugene Springfield area, um, you know, they're they're not coming online for less than three hundred thousand dollars, and and in many places in Corvallis. The average sales price is over four hundred thousand dollars. Same in you know Clackamas County. So what we need to do is find opportunities to get units on the ground quickly and to a price that is actually affordable. So we really are very interested in exploring what does what does it look like for the affordable home ownership kind of development. Um, team, and that's I mean, a network of agencies across the state, to really be looking at manufactured housing as a way to meet many of those goals. So um, I think it was, I mean, great earlier when we talked about the, the vocabulary around this is also has a lot of connotations for folks, right? When you hear trailer park, when you hear manufactured housing, when you hear mobile home, but like what happens when you hear modular home? What happens when you hear like 3D printed home? Like, those sound rad. <laughs> we're really excited about that. And you have, you know, you have a bunch of millennials who aren't buying homes because they can't afford to, because they're strapped with student loan debt, and they don't know how to navigate this space. And when you talk to them about what would it look like to have, you know, to be in a modular home or to be in a 3D printed home, that's super exciting. What does it look like to, you know, live in a manufactured home? Oh, no, thank you. Like that. I don't, I don't think you know. So, so again, the vocab that we use is really important, and so we're working with our education and counseling team about what are you hearing from folks, right? Um, and then, in the same sense, how are we as a network educating people about their options and their um, their rights, and how do they understand the uniqueness of living in a manufactured home? Because, um, I mean, Amy and I can sit here until we're blue in the face and talk to you about all of the the horror stories that we've dealt with during the foreclosure crisis. Because in the, during the foreclosure crisis, we had person after person walk in our door and say, I live in a manufactured home. And the first question was, do you rent the land or do you own the land? They say, I lease the land. And we said, I'm so sorry. There is nothing that we can do. And that is, and people were, you, you had, again, some of the lowest income folks, the most vulnerable folks, becoming homeless because there was nothing, no protections that they had. So for us, it's also a consumer protections issue, right? And it's about how do we make sure that people understand their rights, understand how they can protect themselves and their family. Um, I'm not saying that lease, you know, going into a park and leasing land is a, always a, a bad idea, but making sure we have very knowledgeable, empowered homeowners is really important to us as well. So, um, so that's kind of, like I said, for the second half of, um, 
Crane's a hell of a battle in charge. And I'm so sorry, thank you for being here. And so, but really what we knew is that we wanted to dedicate resources. We needed to dedicate resources. We needed to have um, kind of a, our internal brain trust who could start to navigate these worlds, start to be in lots of these conversations, start to be talking with all of you um, about what is it that you're hearing. Because, um, you know, we work in six counties now um, with, you know, four offices, but that doesn't cover the whole state, right? So what else are you hearing in, um, what are you, like, what is the feedback that you're getting from folks? What is the interest that you're getting as well? So if we talk about um, a manufactured housing as a first-time homebuyer strategy and talk about affordable homeownership development, is there a number that we need to hit as a development agency, right? So, or as a development network, are we looking at, you know, 100 units a year? Are we looking at 300 units a year? And do we have folks who would want to come into that? And I think that's where, like, this group can play a really unique role in helping that pipeline development of potential buyers. So, um, so I can, I'll, I'm happy to toss over to Lorraine. I'm sure I missed something. Um, but uh, we're really excited. I think, as Lisa mentioned as well, with her um, team and with her new staff member kind of creating a handbook, um, we will as well. We'll be getting, you know, any of those things that we can centralize, that are um, that are able to be shared, that are the same across different communities, um, or just resource guides, things like that. Um, it, it's forthcoming. Um, we, and if you, I would just put an, you know, an all call out there if there are ever, um, questions you have, unique things that come up, you're just interested in getting something on someone's radar, um, get it to Amy, get it to Lorraine, we're, um, we're all ears, we're going through a really intense kind of you know, exploration phase right now, I would say probably the next you know, nine to 12 months, um, to get all the information we possibly can to figure out where we fit in this world, where the holes are, where we need to do other advocacy, and where we can really make a difference. <laughs> I'm always amazed how much she can say. She talks to me. <laughs> the first time I met her, I'm like, this <laughs> again. Um, mostly, I'm really interested in hearing what it is that you're seeing and what you're hearing. Um, what are the problems that you see? Um, I was telling Ken that I spent some time yesterday with a legal aid attorney just talking about you know, um, what they're seeing and what their concerns are. Um, one of the things that he asked that I mentioned to you all um, is that um, he sees a trend in um, manufactured home parks that are no longer accepting Section 8 or um, you know, owners that don't want to accept Section 8 vouchers. So, um, and he said for a lot of those people, um, they didn't start out on Section 8. Um, so they had a source of income, or, um, and so it wasn't a difficulty, but they have since had some kind of a setback, and so they now qualify for Section 8, and the homeowner doesn't, uh, or the park owner doesn't want to accept their Section 8 factors. So um, that specifically, if you hear about that or see that, please let me know, because I'd like to send it to Steve Scray. Um, and um, I wanted to, you know, kind of piggyback on your question about, you know, modular versus manufactured home. Another part of that too is modular and manufactured are, are factory built, but when they come to the site, um, a, a modular home is actually considered to be site built, so um, because and it comes as a big crane, so it comes all as one, and they you know kind of set it on the spot. Um, a manufactured home usually comes in pieces on wheels and a chassis. So, um, so actually a manufactured home is considered a factory built and, and, and then modulars are considered site built just to make it even more confusing. <laughs> so, um, so there's a lot of different permutations. Uh, having talked with some owners um, that lived in parks, their biggest concerns are rent. So you know, the things that Lisa talked about you know, one of the things that we're exploring right now is, is there a way to rent to own? So is there a way to have, uh, you know, to, to move towards resident-owned communities if they can't make that big leap? Is there a way that we can package that? So that then they're also building equity, um, so that becomes part of the financing. Um, so those are some of the things that we're looking at. So if you have any information where you've done rent to own um, and you have some thoughts about that, please feel free to contact me. Uh, Look at that. Less than three weeks. It's going to be great. <laughs> it's going to be so great. Do <laughs> we have any quick questions? We're going to wrap this up. Yeah, thanks. Um, I would just be curious if any of you guys have insight on um, how any of the new loan products 
might interact with any kind of foreclosure proceedings or anything like that. Because I know part of the concern with the cattle loans is that if you miss a payment, uh, you can be in breach of contract. So just anything you guys have uh, any insight on uh, foreclosure for chattel loans versus foreclosure for the new types of loan products that we're looking at. Um, any guesses on what that might look like? Uh, I got nothing on that. <laughs> <laughs> I think you know, Craft3 craft would probably be the best resource on that with, their, okay. with the project that they're rolling out because their product is a, it is, it's a, it's, it's a personal property loan. It's yeah. not a. It's not a real estate loan. So, um, I, as, I, my, I assume they put some thought into this. Yeah, they don't. Know. They don't have a lot of. That's that's the pilot. We don't yeah. know yeah. the answer to so that. that yeah. Right. Yeah, it's like when we're things. venturing into most of these homes, people have bought with cash. Yeah. So that's there's why still, we're, we're still trying to understand that market, right? Totally. So, it's a good question. It's yeah. And and I would say you know the next. You know, a, another step is everybody here has talked about the fact that they don't get moved, right? They don't get moved. Mm -hmm. So why aren't they considered real estate? You know, they don't get moved. They're permanent. You know, let's start thinking about that in terms of banks and lenders. Yeah, but the banks and the lenders will tell you that when you don't own that land, that landlord, the, the landlord can evict you. Yeah. And thus, their investment in that home yeah. is suspect. Yeah. And then, if they have to leave, then there's that abandonment process. Yeah. And then, who who has the home, and how does that all work? And it and it becomes very tricky. Yeah. And so, banks are, are more. I'm, I'm not. I don't have to deal with that, so yeah, I'm not sure. going to. Right. So it's typically the manufacturer that is. Um, what Brian yeah. is saying is the manufacturer right. is the one that is providing the financing. And we do have contact information for somebody from Craft Street that was invited to be somebody. here. So if anybody wants to just talk with them directly, it's a new <coughs> product, and um, we can point you to the right person. Thanks, Liz. We give um, our panel a round.